I want to start this video off by telling the university students from Montenegro to f off back to their mountain caves. Stop stealing my budget! <laughs> Welcome to Montenegro, a country known for mountains, beaches and a severe lack of black people despite its name. Montenegro, or as I like to call it, Four Man's Monaco, is the tenth smallest country in Europe, with a population of only 620,000 inhabitants. Located in the Western Balkans, the country is bordered by Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Albania and the place I lost both of my kidneys, which also belongs to Serbia. Montenegro's terrain is mostly characterized by rugged mountains and hills, while in the southwest of the country you can find valleys and lagoons by the coast and Lake Skadar, which is shared with Albania. Around 45% of Montenegro's inhabitants identify themselves as ethnic Montenegrins, 30% identify as Serbs, meanwhile 8.6% as Bosniaks, and the other 16% are various other ethnicities such as the ones that inhabit the place where my previously mentioned kidneys got stolen. But 100% of them steal my budget. MAMULI VAM ye The capital of Montenegro is Podgorica, which has around 185,000 inhabitants and is located in the south of the country, 16 kilometers away from Albania. The first time Podgorica was mentioned was in the 14th century, however the area on which the city lies was inhabited by people since before humans discovered the magic of bronze. Generally speaking, the city is quite small and is mostly known for its administrative role in running the country. Throughout the city you can find many government buildings which were mostly built in the Stalinist architecture style. Independence Square would be the city center, which to be honest is one of the most disappointing squares I've seen as it's quite small and has almost nothing interesting within its periphery other than an obelisk monument and a fountain, which are surrounded by more socialist buildings, which I guess is understandable, considering the square came into existence in 2006 after Montenegro seceded from Serbia. Also around the square you can find numerous restaurants, cafes and boutiques, as is mandatory with all European cities. While the downtown area is a bit lackluster, there still are some interesting buildings in Podgorica, such as the case with the Cathedral of Christ's Resurrection. Prior to World War II on this land used to be a whole other church, however as you can imagine with the events caused by Le Austrian Painter, the church went to meet its maker like 20 million other Europeans. After the commies took over, the people asked the big dick dictator Tito for it to be rebuilt, to which he responded with <laughs> So they had to wait until Yugoslavia went into a middle age crisis and, and died of poorly produced war songs. Thus the church started construction in 1993 and finished in 2013. You can also find Nemanja's town, which are ruins from the 15th century. Around there you can also find the Sastavci Park, which I hear is usually beautiful, however while I was there I don't think it was supposed to have this much water, but you know, to each their own I guess. In addition to Nemanja's town you can find the King Nikola Monument, who was the country's first and only king, reigning from 1860 till 1918 when the government of Montenegro voted to depose him and have Serbia annex the country. Uh, what else? Ah yeah. Throughout the streets of Podgorica and Montenegro in general, you can find quite a lot of politically oriented graffiti which came into existence in 2020, as that was the year when Montenegro finally changed its government after three decades of having the same party rule. The only thing I hate more than women is nothing, I hate women the most, but after them Milo is a close second. Other than that, within the city there's also the Church of St. George, which is a church that lies a bit further from downtown, that's presumably built in the 10th century, as well as the Church of St. Great Martyr George and St. Neomartyrs of Momishichki, which is one of the smallest churches in the region, yet is the resting place of many saints in the Orthodox faith. The church got its name as in 1688 two priests and 40 of their disciples got burned alive by the Turks. Allegedly, the believers got offered their lives in exchange for converting to Islam, but we all know how that ended, due to the, well, name of the church. <laughs> Crossing the Millennium Bridge, we head on northwest into the mountains of Montenegro to make a pilgrimage to the arguably holiest site for the Serbian Orthodox Church, the Ostrog Monastery. To get to the monastery, one must catch a bus going to Montenegro's second largest city, Nikšić, which is around 40 kilometers away from Podgorica. Now, Ostrog lies halfway between the two, 
and considering this is the Balkans, once we reached the halfway point, the bus driver dropped me off in the middle of nowhere and told me to walk towards the village of Bogatici. Once I arrived there, I asked if there were any buses or taxis going up the mountain, but considering I decided to come here in the middle of February, and during a world pandemic, the answer was as you can imagine, <laughs> no. So I was forced to walk 10 kilometers up the mountain. Fortunately, on my way up, a young couple picked me up in their car and instead of stealing my internal organs like some other ethnic groups found in the Balkans, they actually drove me up to the monastery. I'm glad that there's still some humanity left. Anyways, the monastery was built in the mid 17th century by Saint Basil of Ostrog, or colloquially known as Sveti Vasilye Ostroški, who was the Archbishop of Herzegovina. What makes this place special, other than the fact that this beauty of a building is built inside of a mountain, is that Saint Basil is buried within the monastery complex. But Nick, a saint being buried at a monastery isn't anything new. That shit's all over Europe. Well, that's where you're wrong, kiddo, because it is believed that Saint Basil was and still is able to perform miracles. Over 100,000 pilgrims visit the monastery each year, both Christians and Muslims alike, as it is believed that if one prays over the body of Saint Basil, their illnesses will be cured, or at least noticeably reduced. Another interesting fact about the monastery is that during World War II, a detachment of a Chetnik division took refuge here. When the partisans discovered them, they promised them they would be spared if they surrendered, which they did. And in true communist fashion, the partisans proceeded to shoot them in the head. Moving on from the monastery, I headed on to Nikšić, where I went to catch my bus for my final destination in Montenegro. Over there one is able to see the famous Nikšić bridge, quite epic if I do say so myself, and from then on I caught the bus and went south to Montenegro's revered coastline and the city of Herceg Novi. Now Herceg Novi is a coastal town located in the Bay of Kotor, only 3 kilometers away from Croatia, and is considered to be the third largest city in Montenegro with a population of around 33,000. Originally the town was known as Castel Nuovo, meaning New Castle as it was under the control of the Venetians and a part of the Albania Veneta. Today the city is known as a tourist hotspot due to its medieval architecture and sunny beaches, which aren't all that sunny in February, but cut me some slack, the bus tickets were cheap this time of year, okay? The downtown area is known as Old Town, where you can find the Bella Vista Square, which is filled with a variety of medieval Mediterranean buildings, which hosts a diverse selection of shops and cafes. Right in the middle you can spot the Church of St. Michael Archangel, which is one magnificent church. It was built in the early 20th century and is a mix of several architecture styles, ranging from Gothic to Romanesque, all the way to Islamic. Overlooking the church is the clock tower, which many view as the symbol of the city. Heading down Old Town, you can find another church, this one being the St. Jeronim Church, which was built in the 19th century. While the Church of St. Michael belongs to the Orthodox denomination, St. Jeronim is a part of the Catholic one and St. Jeronim is seen as the protector of the city and recognized by both denominations. Not far from there you will reach the sea coast where you will be met with the rocky beaches and blue waters. Above the beaches stands tall the sea fortress known as Forte Mare. It is believed that the fort was built sometime in the 14th century by the Bosnian king Tvrtko, whose monument you can find nearby. Over the years it switched ownership between the Venetians and Ottomans and it even belonged to the Austrians at one point in the early 20th century. There you can find the Square Harbor, which hosts a variety of boats for personal and commercial use. A bit further up, there's also the Spanish Fortress, which came into existence in the mid-16th century, when the Spanish controlled the area for exactly one year and decided to start building a fort. In the end, the Turks ended up finishing what they had started, but were kind enough to let them keep the name. Meanwhile, on the other side of town lies the Sabina Monastery. According to local legend, Saint Saba, the main saint 99% of Serbs adore, built this church himself in the 13th century. It was built in a Dalmatian Baroque style and it's quite cute. And yeah, that would be Montenegro. A small country located in the hilly Balkans, covered in mountains and beaches, one place you should definitely visit during the summer. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, click that subscribe button. And stay tuned, my name is Nick and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe.
Grba Kamila, odmah se pomaga.